What is the animal loving nephrologist's favorite hobby? I don't know. Collecting ducks. All right. (laughs) (laughs) That was my favorite. (laughs) Two of you to create that? That was a two person (laughs) operation. (laughs) I've never been angrier. (laughs) I love Paul's reaction. (laughs) Totally worth it. All right. And now on to the episode. The Curbsiders Podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. Furthermore, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of the host and should not be interpreted to reflect the official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash back more hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we aren't responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. You know, Paul, I, I just haven't quite figured out how to start the show. Welcome back to The Curbsiders. I'm Dr. Matthew Otto here with my great friend, Dr. Paul Nelson-Williams. Paul, how are you doing tonight? I, yeah, I'm great, Matt. And just in terms of feedback, I think that was good. That felt right. It was the right <laughs> level of energy. <laughs> Thank you. I need constant uh, reinforcement <laughs> that I'm doing a good job, like like we all do, Paul. On tonight's show, Paul, this is this is a repost of a Curbsiders classic from Neff Madness 2019, Back when we were brand new in this Neff Madness game, of course, we had a great pun to open the show here, and uh, that was brought to us by Hannah Abrams, who just did this wonderful pun ca- contest, if you can remember, way back when. And I, Paul, you're a huge fan of puns, aren't you? Yeah, no, wonderful pun contest is an oxymoron if ever there was one, but these were as good as they get, probably. And for the audience, Paul doesn't like to say puns. But when prompted, he can just like unleash them uh, seemingly with machine gun rapidity. It's crazy. So he's, I'm not sure that he's being extremely forthcoming with us. I mean, I'm good at Uh, fixing plumbing too, but that's not something I necessarily want to do with my spare time. (laughs) Paul, before I tell them a little bit more about this episode and our guests, can you remind them what is it that we do on the Curbsiders? Sure, Matt. We are the Internal Medicine Podcast, and we use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. As you mentioned, this is a little bit of a reboot as part of our pod crawl that you'll tell us about. So we had multiple expert interviews, or at least multiple experts, and kind of one mishmash of interview. And I'll let you tell us a little bit about why we're doing this and what we talked about. Sure. So this... Uh, this is part of a pod crawl. As you mentioned, there were six different podcasts that we decided this year, hey, let's all get together. Let's all make Neff Madness themed episodes and listeners can go around and listen to each of the different podcasts. So ours was on cardio renal syndrome. There's also podcasts by the Doctors Washington, the Cribsiders, Up My Nursing Game, BS Medicine and Freely Filtered. We'll put the links in our show notes to all those episodes. So be sure to check those out and check out some of the great other internal medicine podcasts out there and pediatric medicine, I should say, because of course, Cribsiders, pediatric medicine. But Paul, this episode that they're about to hear is hepatorenal syndrome, which surely, Paul, we all understand that it's it's an easy topic, right? Yeah, no, easy to manage, easy to understand, easy to treat. So really, just I'm not even sure we needed the episode, but I'm. I'm we have a lot of great, that. highly effective therapies. <laughs> yep. um, on this episode, I talked with three wonderful guests. Of course, our chief of nephrology, doc- Dr. Joel Toff. We had Dr. Bill Whitaker of Rush and Dr. Juan Carlos Velez, who is a and just an expert on hepatorenal syndrome. And as we were alluding to, this is a really complicated topic, and. It was interesting to get sometimes differing opinions amongst our experts and just telling you how much uncertainty there is around this topic, but they really gave us some great insights. So without further ado, let's get on to this interview about hepatorenal syndrome. We got to, we got to start with our chief of nephrology, Dr. Joel Toff. Hi, uh, Joel Toff is a uh, 49-year-old clinical nephrologist. He has managed to straddle the worlds of uh, private practice and academic medicine. He's a partner at St. Clair Nephrology in Detroit while having an academic appointment at William Beaumont Oakland University School of Medicine, where he teaches kidney physiology to second-year medical students. He also does clinical teaching to third years and fourth years, as well as teaching the internal medicine residents and nephrology fellows at Ascension St. John. He's best known as his Twitter alter ego, kidney boy. <laughs> Joe, I, and I told you too that my kids, they heard the uh, diuretic episode 
and they were like, this guy sounds like Batman. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then when Your I told, children. and then when I told them that I was going to tell you that they were, they're like five and six. They were like so embarrassed. They're like, don't tell them we said that. So now I'm going to tell them in front of a national audience. Uh, I can, I can neither <laughs> confirm nor deny whether I'm Batman. <laughs> <laughs> You're a very kidney specific Batman. <laughs> that's what we, is there a kidney like a bat signal for the kidney? That's that's uh, that's what they do around St. Clair nephrology. Joel just shows up. Okay, let's let's talk, uh, Bill. You're Bill. Why don't you t- give the audience a one liner? This is your first time on the show, so tell them a little bit about yourself and maybe something outside of what you do in medicine. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm an academic nephrologist at Rush University in Chicago, and I've been a nephrologist for about 15 years. Uh, I'm active in teaching and clinical research, and, um, and I'm probably best known for um, being the most, you know, as opposed to, well, except for Joel and JCV, I'm probably <laughs> known as the most handsome nephrologist uh, in America. <laughs> uh, I don't know, Matt. Have you ever been to a nephrology conference? Uh, not yet. I'm I, I'm aspiring to attend one in the future, though. So, so being the most handsome nephrologist, if you go there, you will see that this is not actually something that's true. I mean, it's not even so. And the other thing is, if we can make sure this stays audio file as opposed to video, then the myth can live on. Yeah, my, uh, and my other question was going to be: Do you want this? <laughs> we are going to have some nephrologists listening to this. Are you sure you want me not to? Do you want me to cut this whole part right here? Or you... <laughs> just, just keep the myth alive, but but make sure it's audio okay. only because I really don't need anybody finding out factual information about this nonsense. Okay, so, I got. Matt, thanks for having me on, though. Okay, JC, did you want to give a one-liner about yourself? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, Juan Carlos Vélez, I'm a 48-year-old. Peruvian nephrologist, uh, work practicing nephrology in the United States uh, for also about uh, uh, 15 years, 13 years, lost count. Um, and uh, my uh, Twitter handle is uh, it's uh, at Veles Nef Hepato, which uh, comes uh, handy with this uh, tonight's discussion. Uh, and that reflects one of my main areas of interest, which is uh, hepatorenal physiology. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm current, uh, chair of, of nephrology at Oxnard Clinic Foundation in New Orleans, where I moved to two years ago and outside medicine, I, my three, uh, favorite hobbies are number one, to play soccer, number two, to talk about soccer and number three, to watch soccer. So <laughs> you get the point. I like it. Well, I think it's time now that we move on to a case from Cash Slack Memorial so that we can start talking about the main event here. Uh, so this is, this is of course, inspired by Neff Madness. The Bill, you had written about this, uh, you had written about two topics for Neff Madness, and we decided to sort of make this more general, kind of gear this one more towards our general internist audience. So we're going to start with a case here. This is Mr. Clyde Rosis. He is a 54-year-old male with known cirrhosis from... Uh, Severe alcohol use disorder, and he presents to the emergency department with swollen legs, abdominal distension. He's had previous large volume paracentesis for ascites. He's previously been treated for SBP. He has known varices, previous hospitalizations for hepatic encephalopathy. He's currently being worked up for liver transplant, and previous MELD score was 26. His creatinine was 1.4, INR 1.5 at the time. He takes the following medications. Furosemide, spironolactone, lactulose, omeprazole, propranolol for variceal uh, bleeding prophylaxis. He's on trim sulfa for SBP prophylaxis, and he admits sometimes he's not taking all his medications. On admission, you know you um, on admission, a diagnostic paracentesis shows signs of SBP, and he's initiated on treatment with ceftriaxone. The labs on admission. Uh, are pretty much what we'd expect from someone with end-stage liver disease, but now we're noting that the creatinine is 2.6, his baseline is 1.4, and his serum sodium is 130. So uh, we're gonna, everyone's gonna get a chance to talk here. Bill, Bill, I'm gonna start with you. When you when you see a patient like this, 
How do you kind of approach this newly elevated creatinine in a patient with cirrhosis? Yeah, unfortunately, this is becoming more and more common. I, I think the first thing to make sure, you know, and it's certainly as somebody who has alcoholic cirrhosis, thinking that, that there's some sort of hemodynamic insult that's happening to the kidney. Um, but in other patients who have cirrhosis from hepatitis C or possibly autoimmune, they could have another inflammatory glomerular disease going on. The first place you want to start is by just looking at the routine urinalysis and make sure that just there's that that's consistent with a hemodynamic media injury. No blood, no protein, and make sure it's really just a bland urine. Once you're there, and most often it is there, 95% of the time, and certain, probably 99% of the time in someone with alcohol cirrhosis, then you're looking at some varied degree of not enough blood getting to the kidney. Okay? And there's a lot of different uh, ways to get that, but the three main ways that you want to break it down to in your mind is, could this be um, not enough blood to the kidney, meaning the kidney is just pre-renal, and it's still going to respond to getting that patient to euvolemia? That'd be the first one. The second one would be not enough blood getting the kidney now that the kidney's in complete shock, which would be ATN or acute tubular necrosis. And then the third one, which is probably the most common, is not enough blood getting to the kidney and that's because of this persistent liver disease uh, and the physiology that goes behind that. And so the way to sort of sort out those three is by using the urine sodium uh, or the fractional excretion of sodium as well. And, and this is just sort of on a board's um, view. Uh, when you're in practice and in real life, sometimes it doesn't always work out perfectly, kind of like... Uh, Urine eosinophils are an incredible test on your boards. The positive predictive value of urine eosinophils for interstitial nephritis on your boards is somewhere around 98%. But the positive predictive value in real life for urine eosinophils is somewhere around 40%. And it's a horrible test that I have never ordered in 15 years. So some of these things are, um, are real life and some of them for the boards. But what you want to really do then after your analysis is bland is check that the urine sodium is either in the phena is either low or not low. And if it's not low, you're, let, you're possibly in this realm of ATN or acute tubular necrosis. Therapy for that is supportive. The kidney's stunned. We've got to wait and let it get better. Still try to establish euvolemia. And if you're in the low FENA realm, then the differential comes down to being prerenal or not. So classically, we would always give a volume challenge. And if everything gets better, then it's just prerenal. If everything doesn't get better, then you're into this hepatorenal um, vortex, if you will. Yeah, I'd like to. Can you hear me? Am I coming through? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I, I'd like to just step in there, just and just kind of from a uh, kind of uh, add on to that bit about the wards and about uh, actually taking care of patients, and that in my mind, in the presence of cirrhosis, you're always going to have a low urine sodium and a low fena, and I don't find that like again if the fena is elevated if you have an elevated urine sodium yeah you're going to be de de dealing with ATN but again if the fena is low all the different the full differential is still on the table it can still be ATN it can still be prerenal and it can still be hepatorenal so I, I just want to emphasize you know for really taking care of patients the a low fena doesn't rule anything out and you're going to have to deal with the full realm and the other thing I'd like to uh, also emphasize is uh, the specificity of the urinalysis also falls off. Is that uh, when you have an elevated bilirubin in these, which these patients typically have, uh, just uh, uh, typical Highland casts get real stained and will often be misread as um, as uh, dirty gra yeah as dirty granular casts, um, and and you may miss uh, interpret that UA as a uh, uh, in indicative of acute tubular necrosis when all it is is somebody who could be either pre-renal or hepatorenal syndrome, which will both have these stained highland casts. So you just need to be real careful and not to prematurely jump to your diagnosis. And highland casts, generally benign finding, just kind of protein. Yeah. They're usually clear, but you're saying in the presence of bilirubin, they're just kind of stained that color. That, that's exactly right. Uh, yeah. So what we see these highland casts anytime you get concentrated in acidic urine, which is going to happen in, you know, first morning urines have a lot of them, pre-renal patients have a lot of them, and cirrhotic patients are going to have a lot of them. JC, is there anything you would add to the differential diagnosis that, that Bill was highlighting there? 
before I would do that, I would try to just emphasize a couple of things. So assessment of these patients is is always challenging. And I think that um, at the end of the day, you just need to do everything that everybody does, but just do it as best as possible. And that starts with the history and physical, you know. Uh, you cannot underestimate the power of that. You know, if you have somebody coming in with 15 bowel movements on lactulose, yeah, you're gonna you're gonna have to do a very hard, hard you're gonna have a hard time convince me that that patient does not uh, have just perennial azotemia. Uh, you know, it, so is but did anybody double the serum lactone to 200 milligrams a day it recently, a week ago, prior to those elements in the history are very very helpful. So that's the exercise that I try to do. Get a lot from the history. Um, and then once you examine the patient, uh, it's also important, you know, if you look at it, all the reviews and, and recommendations about about renal talk about volume expansion first, given albumin. And if you have somebody that comes in with cirrhosis and has got bilateral hydrothorax and maybe some even pulmonary edema, very edematous, you, you can't just volume expand those patients. You know, it could be detrimental for the patient. So those things that you have to do always in the beginning. You were you were describing kind of two different patients. One patient who's clearly um, hypovolemic, and then another patient who's who's got pleural effusions, edema, ascites, are clearly volume overloaded. How how can we approach those two patients differently? Uh, what what would you do with that those patients? Let's maybe we'll take the volume overloaded patient first. Well, I, I guess the importance of that is that uh, as we're going to probably. Uh, uh, discuss uh, throughout and t- tonight later on is that uh, a lot of times when you assess these patients with acute kidney injury in the context of cirrhosis, uh, if your initial workup with the urine analysis is unrevealing, urine sodium is less than 20, everything else is equal, you're kind of forced in a situation, okay, this patient could be hepatorenal, but could also just be volume depleted. And, and it's important to, to assess the patient uh, before you just jump, pull the trigger with with albumin. If a patient is has signs of volume overload, further volume expansion could be uh, detrimental to the patient. And you don't have to follow the book necessarily. You have to deviate and look at the patient. So, all right, you know, I'm not going to volume expand this patient. This probably this patient is already probably into a hepatorenal physiology. Uh, conversely, if you have a cirrhotic that uh, doesn't have any peripheral edema, you know, you uh, how often do you see that? You don't find any kind of butter-like edema around the ankles. The, then you know, I start to wonder, you know, if this patient doesn't have any peripheral edema and the situs is kind of soft, maybe that's an indication of, of, of volume depletion for that particular patient. And I'll be much more uh, confident uh, with a trial of intravenous albumin for the first 24 hours. So those are the things that 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 I use to try to uh, decide my first steps when you assess these patients. Hey JCV, you use that term uh, hepatorenal physiology. Can you can you just kind of walk us through what you mean when you say that? Yeah, I, it's kind of a, something that I've uh, adopted from tradition, really. I re- see uh, here in my former mentors, uh, you know, Jim Tomlin and Charlie O'Neill at Emory, when I was a fellow, they would use it. And even when I was a resident in Chicago, my mentor, John Ball, would use that. And it kind of made sense to me that, you know, we try to have this this uh, dichotomized approach that whether you have hepatorenal syndrome as the only cause of AKI or you don't. And that clearly is really pro- not the case. You know, even, it's the same situation when we talk about perennial azotemia and ATN. You know, those are ends of a spectrum. So what I mean when I say about renal physiology is that you have a, a, a patient with cir- advanced cirrhosis. They have circulatory dysfunction with uh, peripheral vasodilation and splanchnet vasodilation and renal vasoconstrictors. Uh, increased levels of, uh, you know, increased activation of sympathetic nervous system and renin system, all that is in place. And, and that's definitely going to affect uh, kidney function to some extent. Uh, and so you could be volume depleted and have the same pathophysiology going on at the same time. You could already have intrinsic tubular injury, but you can still have all the same uh, hormonal systems uh, trigger and active. So I think that's why I, I try to use that terminology to recognize that you can have coexistence of 
of, of more than one uh, uh, you know pathophysiological process in the same patient. And Jay Z, right. this is why it's it's difficult for us as internists. Let's say you're you're in the hospital, you're seeing this patient. They come in, and they let's say we think they're dry based on the history. Like the example you gave, they've been having. 15 bowel movements a day from lactulose, should we be giving them, and their creatinine's 2.6 like this patient, would, would you choose colloid? Would you give albumin as the fluid? And then there's more than one type of albumin. So which one should we give? If, if you could be specific so our audience can kind of try to actually use this information in practice. Uh, sure. Uh, I, I have to say that I don't have necessarily... Uh, a, a, any position that is very strong about the percentage of albumin. You know, typically we do the, the 12, uh, 25% or 12.5% albumin that is available in the hospital. Uh, I am not aware of anybody uh, publishing a study comparing 5% versus that. I'm not even aware of anybody comparing colloids versus crystalloids in the, in, in the setting of cirrhosis. A lot of what we do in the management of these patients come from from this uh, international club of ascites that that have shared their expertise through through, through many, many years, and they uh, decided to provide guidelines. Many of those guidelines ba- are based on their expertise. And, of course, there is some foundation to 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 support the use of albumin in cirrhosis and that's what i do um it, it's uh, i i do think it's probably more effective but but I, I don't know if we have really strong science to show that it's better than than uh crystalloids yeah jcv that i i i kind of have the feeling that uh the volume of distribution of saline in the presence of cirrhosis is essentially infinite that, that saline that you give just ends up in their ascites very quickly and is not a not an effective solution and so in those patients i'm, I'm also reaching for colloids yeah no absolutely uh, i think that's what, what we do we've been doing that and that's kind of the general recommendation uh, I guess my point is if you have a cirrhotic that has uh, presents with volume depletion um, from uh, from lactulose or from diarrhea or from overdiuresis, uh, you know, occasionally I, have, I do, do both. I give them uh, albumin and may give them some, uh, some saline along with that. I mean, it, it's, it's not the norm, but when the patients are clearly volume depleted, uh, I may use both. But but not 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 commonly. And I think your point's a good one. There's this big spectrum here of this hepatorenal versus ATN versus pre-renal, and we're always trying to figure out which one it is. But you know what? Pre-renal is going to get better if you get more blood to the kidney. Hepatorenal is going to get better if you get more blood to the kidney. And ATN eventually is going to get better if you give enough time and give more blood to the kidney. So we're always trying to establish euvolemia in these patients. And the only way to establish euvolemia in any patient because you, there's not a good test for volume in anyone, is to go in and look at them. And just like Juan Carlos is saying, is if they are massively, you know, for cirrhotic, if they've got a kind of a softer belly, they've by the history, they've had all these bowel movements, maybe you need to give them some intravenous volume resuscitation, and usually we choose colloid in this situation. But if, they're, if they've got JVP up the wazoo and they've got Rawls, you know, we know we're going to be taking more of a nephrocentric viewpoint to diuresing the heck out of them to get rid of all their ascites and everything. So a lot of it comes down to the bedside, which is sometimes hard to figure out on a board's question. <laughs> Bill, what what diuretics might you choose? Because it's it's always been a bit confusing to me. I know when you read sp- spironolactone is supposed to be the first one you give. How do you start diuretics on this patient? Let's say they come into the ER and they're the patient that we think is more on the volume overloaded side. What might you get, What might a starting regimen look like? The different diuretics are confusing to some people, but they kind of all come down to how much water and how much volume you're trying to get into your urine. And in a patient with cirrhosis, they have water overload and volume overload. And so it's really nice to pick a diuretic that gets rid of both. So I usually start with a loop diuretic, but knowing the pathophysiology is such high activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, I'm very quick to add uh, aldosterone antagonists. Um, So I'll often do both together. Well, I'll give a loop diuretic and aldactone. Watching, of course, you know, for the potassium. Um, and uh, we typically in the cardiorenal patients are even using metolazone or some of the loop diuretics. But 
Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the, some of the um, thiazide diuretics, but those can sometimes get you into trouble with further hyponatremia. So I typically, I typically stick to loops and aldactone. Joel, any magic to the starting doses there? Is it like, do you keep to this ratio, you know, the 100 of sp- spironolactone to, to 40 of furosemide? I'm a little hesitant to load up spironolactone in patients that have failing kidneys. Right. I get, you know, the thing that's going to push you to force you to decide whether you're going to dialyze or not is going to be that hyperkalemia. And I'm reluctant unless I see good urine output and, uh, and, a, and a kidney that I'm convinced is going to be doing okay before I start hitting them with the high doses of spironolactone. Yeah. Much more comfortable. With, much, much more comfortable with furosemide. So for this for this patient here, I'm gonna I want I want uh, Joel. I'll ask you to nickel down on what what dose of Lasix might you hit him with? Are you gonna do, use your twenty times creatinine formula? Never fails. Okay, <laughs> okay. So twenty times two point six. A- actually, let's let let's back up a little bit. Uh, because he's cir- the patients with cirrhosis oftentimes have a lower creatinine than you would expect. They tend to have their decreased muscle mass, decreased creatinine production from their liver disease. Their creatinine probably overestimates their GFR, and their kidney function is probably worse than what you would think just by looking at their creatinine. So I may push a little bit higher on that Lasix dose than the 20 times creatinine. Okay. So instead of like roughly this would have been, this person would have been around 60. So you might give them 80 or, or more to start with. That's right. That's exactly right. All right. This episode is brought to you by Grammarly. Audience, you know I'm a fan of Grammarly. Grammarly is more than spelling and grammar checker. It's an all-in-one writing tool that allows you to clearly and effectively communicate your ideas. And believe me, I need help with that. We've talked about this before, the curbsiders, we're putting out show notes every week, we're sending tons of emails, and we want to sound smart, we want to be concise, and Grammarly Premium lets us be persuasive and confident in our writing and have a polished tone. Grammarly has tone adjustments where we can suggest how we want something to sound. Do we want it to sound fun and playful? Do we want it to sound more business-like? Well, Grammarly, they've got us covered with that. One thing that I really love is Grammarly's full sentence rewrites because sometimes the way I word things doesn't make any sense and Grammarly be like, hey, Watto, that doesn't make any sense. Why not say it this way instead? Get through those emails, end your work quicker by keeping it concise, confident, and effective with Grammarly. Go to Grammarly.com slash curb to sign up for a free account. And when you're ready to upgrade to Grammarly Premium, get 20% off for being our listener. That's 20% off at G-R-A-M-M-A-R-L-Y dot com slash curb. Our sponsor for this episode is Panacea Financial, the national bank for doctors by doctors. And as a doctor, you know the average bank isn't built for our community. They see our debt levels and our limited credit history as red flags, but at Panacea Financial, they get it because they have lived it. As a bank founded by two physicians, they are dedicated to providing solutions for the unique needs of doctors and doctors in training, including their PRN personal loan. They offer a period of no payments or low affordable payments, no cosigner requirement, and low fixed interest rates that don't depend on your credit score. So even if you personally don't need Panacea's doctor-specific loans, tell a friend about it. They can help with student loan refinance or even practice buy-in loans. And when you refer a friend, you can get up to $250 for each referral without any limits on how many people you can refer. Join the growing number of doctors nationwide that expect more from their bank and have switched to Panacea Financial. Visit PanaceaFinancial.com today to learn how a bank for doctors by doctors can help you. That's PanaceaFinancial.com. Panacea Financial is a division of Premise Member FDIC. The, The next question kind of back to the differential diagnosis, these patients could be obstructed as well. And usually I've seen that they say you have to get the renal ultrasound. Now we've, this is another thing we've kind of fought about on previous episodes where we think the renal ultrasound, unless someone has risk factors for obstruction, it's kind of a low yield. Uh, JC, do you think we, is is that something that you get on all, would you get one on this guy? He's not really giving us a history of, of obstruction. No he has no issues with BPH that we know of, no history of kidney stones. Uh, 
Yeah, we, we always we always get a ring ultrasound. Uh, but you're right. If you want to be uh, really uh, uh, accurate with making statements, you would say ring ultrasound is a mandatory test in the assessment of chronic kidney disease, but is not a mandatory test in the assessment of AKI. But 99.9% of the times it gets ordered. And I am guilty myself, I would say. Just get an ultrasound. Just be complete the workup. But, but if you ask me the question um, whether it's always needed, I don't think so. I don't think it's always needed. And, and, and not only the history of the suspicion uh, is also the urine uh, findings. If you have a urinalysis that shows no protein, no blood, then you have it is less likely that you're going to be dealing with some sort of parenchymal renal disease. Uh, but if you have hematuria proteinuria, at that point, you must obtain a renal ultrasound because you, you can have some distorted anatomy that is going to uh, point you in a different direction when you look at a differential. Okay. You know, my, my feeling on that ultrasound is it's a, uh, uh, it's, a call, it's a test that has no risk to the patient, and it is one of the few causes of AKI where you can fix it. Right. This is a, if you find that obstruction, like to me, it's a, I, I, it's unacceptable to ever miss that. Yeah. To, to have a, you know, the treatment of obstruction is not dialysis, right? We have effective ways of taking care of that. And I completely concur that it's cost benefit ratio may not work out and it may, and it's positive very few times, but I think it's unacceptable to miss that diagnosis. And right. so I always order it. The, the workaround we had suggested, uh, it, it might be a little complicated in someone with cirrhosis and ascites, but bladder scan, or you can, you know, if you can palpate the bladder, put a foley in, <laughs> let the drain the urine, you know. Bladder then, scan and cirrhosis with yeah. ascites is a really tough one. Yeah, I mean, right, I, right. Like, so, but, but, but I, I get it. Obviously, yeah. you know, if you're going to the masses, you shouldn't order renal ultrasound on anybody. No. But just like everybody said, it's, in, it's relatively inexpensive, low risk. And reversible cause of renal failure. Yeah, hard to um, hard to say. You don't want to order that test because you can miss something irreversible. And are you recommending a, a foley, uh, Bill? I'll ask you first. Uh, do you generally put a foley? Let's say this patient was oliguric, creatinine two point six, coming in the door. Um, we're we're going to be. Uh, we were talking about the case where we were thinking we might do diuretics if we think they're overloaded. But are you putting a foley in those patients or? Do you think that's necessary? Yeah, I'm not sure that I'm allowed to do a Foley catheter at Rush anymore um, <laughs> because uh, every time I've tried to do one, um, uh, everybody yells at me about CAUDIs, which are these you know catheter associated UTIs. And of course, we don't and as a nephrologist, we don't really need a Foley just to measure urine output and make ourselves uh, satisfied. We can use other tests to sort of differentiate those. But but if you have a man who comes in with renal failure and it's undetermined what the etiology is, uh, a Foley can be diagnostic and therapeutic. Uh, so sometimes I, I will I will put that in. Although this guy may have platelets that are low, he may have an INR that's high. There may be other complications with that, and he's got some pretty other obvious reasons for a ki- acute kidney injury. So I don't think that I would be uh, I would go in there and start screaming about how this person didn't get a Foley that you know when I come in in the morning after uh, the night. Uh, of uh, unmorning report or something, I'd be okay with not having a foley in this patient since we have so many other etiologies of his renal failure. I'm gonna I'm gonna move us along with our case a little bit, and we've we've talked about some of these things already. So let's say I, I've already given you the patient the patient's creatinine is 2.6. He says he's peeing less. Urinalysis. There's no protein. There's no hematuria. We do get the renal ultrasound. It just shows mild chronic parenchymal disease. His urine sodium is less than 10. There were no muddy brown casts on the urine microscopy. Urine eosinophils were ordered uh, just to, to piss Bill off, and uh, <laughs> they're negative. <laughs> uh, Shocking. Yeah. Shocking that they're not helpful. And uh, we stopped. He was on, um, he was, he was on trim sulfa, which we stopped. Uh, along with the diuretics, let's we're we're back to saying let's say that this was one of the patients where we we felt coming in the door we weren't exactly sure of the volume status we decided to it wasn't really pointing strongly in either direction so we started we decided to hold the diuretics so at this point it, it seems like the initial kind of where where we are the initial workups negative so now we have to try to figure out how to perfuse the kidneys right how to get blood flow to the kidneys bill. Um, and maybe I'll try to summarize a little bit, and then you guys can correct me if I'm missing anything, just to make sure. 
we so we said we're definitely going to do a history and physical exam. See, you know, is this person gaining weight? Uh, do the, do their lungs sound like they're filled with fluid? Their legs and belly feel like they're full with fluid? Or is this the person that says they they've been nauseous, vomiting, having diarrhea, haven't been able to eat or drink anything? You know, those are the two extremes. Unfortunately, a lot of the times we have people in the middle, and that's kind of where it becomes tricky. Uh, we we got the basic workup, which was just sort of uh, some urine sodium, maybe maybe calculate a fena. Uh, urine ultra, uh, renal ultrasound or place a Foley if you're allowed to at your institution. <laughs> and then uh, and then from there, uh, JC, why don't I throw it to you? What might be a next step for the patient where you're not exact, you're not quite sure about the volume status? Yeah. So that's a very common scenario, right? And unfortunately in this field of nephrology, um, a lot of times our best diagnostic tests are our therapeutic trials, right? We are in a situation where we think this could be uh, the diagnosis, but we're never certain. Rarely. I, w- I wouldn't say never, but we're rarely. Oh, JC, you c- cut out for a second. You said we're rarely, we're rarely certain, I think you were saying. I may be able to help finish what he was saying. Yeah. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I think that um, any volume issue is, like I said earlier, difficult. If it's cardiorenal or hepatorenal, we have tests for water, right? I mean, I know when someone's water depleted, they're hyponatremic. I know when somebody's water overloaded, they're hyponatremic. Those are easy to to define and determine how much water someone needs removed and how much water someone needs to be given. But volume is an assessment. It's, it's a judgmental assessment. And, and what you need to do is obviously look at the patient, like we've said. And then the one thing that you don't do when you're worried about a volume disorder is you don't treat with both uh, diuretics and volume resuscitation at the same time. Um, w- there, there are times when I will give Lasix and normal saline at the same time. I may be trying to get, get rid of potassium. I may be trying to get rid of water and fix somebody's hyponatremia. I may be trying to get rid of calcium. There's all sorts of reasons to do so. Uh, when you're not sure of someone's volume, though, giving them intravenous volume and Lasix, same. So what you end up doing clinically is you kind of pick one. You go into the bedside. You see if the patient's what you think is more volume depleted versus volume overload, and you pick that. So you diurese the heck out of the next day, and the more is atemic, and you were wrong. Or you give them seven liters of normal saline the next day, and they're intubated, and you were wrong. <laughs> but you know, you and, I, and I'm sort of joking, but at the same time, you know then, because you haven't done both at once, You do if you do both at once the next day, you're screwed. You have no idea what happened. So you pick one based on the least clinical harm and based on your best judgment, because that's what volume assessment is. And then you go with that and you kind of go all in on that. And then you decide if you've made them better or not. And honestly, in most cirrhotics, especially if they're hepatorenal and they're always a relative hepatorenal because of the lack of the blood to the kidney, it's really hard to make them better until their liver gets better. Joel, anything to add there? Any, uh, you were nodding a lot, so it seems like you you kind yeah, of a lot no, of that he, resonates. Yeah, we, we, I think we're cut from the same cloth. We're both we're both clinicians first, uh, and the the only other thing that bothers me is when someone says, "Okay, I think their volume depleted," but then they give seventy five cc's an hour of fluid, and so the next day you're like, "Well, we did give them a fluid challenge, but I'm not sure if it was enough." Like, don't. Make sure you give enough so that if it didn't work, you're going to say we were wrong, not that we didn't quite get there. Like you're, you're giving yourself 24 hours to do it. Give enough that you're going to be on one side of the fence or the other by the next day and never go and not saying, eh, maybe we need to do this for another day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I completely agree with that, Joel. Uh, this is one of the things that, and that applies to any form of AKI. When you are deciding to do a fluid challenge, I always tell the residents on my team, hey, what time is it? It's 4.20 p.m. in the afternoon. We get this consult. By the time you uh, give your recommendations to give fluids and the residents get the message and then pass on to the, uh, put the orders in the computer, the nurses get it, the pharmacy ships the truck to the floor. You know, it's midnight before the, uh, the fluid bag is at the bedside. And, and the, the next blood draws at 4 a.m. <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's, it's always that. So it's always try to make sure that you uh, plan it correctly so the next morning you have an answer that the intervention worked or not. 
I was reading that the albumin is one one gram per kilogram. Uh, yeah, one gram per kilogram per day for at least forty eight hours is sort of the traditional albumin challenge. Is that something that you're routinely doing? Or you mentioned maybe giving saline and albumin. I know saline is much quicker to get your hands on. So that's probably what I would start with, especially when I'm first seeing the person. No, I think that the the, the volume replacement, volume uh, expansion should be done with albumin in this patient, uh, 25 grams IVQ6. The only instances that I recommended adding saline is when I the patient was in an obvious state of volume depletion and I have a clear history and exam and I am convinced I'm going to give him more than just the albumin, but that's not the norm. The norm is just to do the traditional 25 grams IVQ6 for the first 24 hours and reassess. Got it. Okay. JC, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask real quick with, with the albumin that we're giving, can you, can you kind of talk about how that relates to the pathophysiology? You, you mentioned before splanchnic uh, vaso, uh, vasodilation. Can you kind of walk us through that again and how these different therapies are going to, that we're going to talk about are going to hit each part of that? Yeah, sure. So, so the, the, this cirrhotic state, uh, it's a state of uh, hyperdynamic circulation, uh, the stiff liver triggers uh, a number of uh, vasodilators, uh, primarily nitric oxide, that causes uh, splachnic vasodilation. So that leads to a, a very poor effector circulatory volume that is bred uh, by this sympathetic nervous system and the renin-utensin system uh, that subsequently lead to re- uh, release of uh, vasoconstrictors, uh, norepinephrine, and utensin 2, etc., uh, there's also an, a different pathway that leads to this uh, renal vasoconstriction, which is known as a hepatorenal reflex. Not a very, uh, not a very uh, popular uh, 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 hypothesis of the pathogenesis, but it's very intriguing. It relates to increases in portal pressure itself, uh, sending a sympathetic signal to the brain back to the kidney to trigger vasoconstriction. So. It's a mechanism that doesn't really relate to the effective secretory volume. Um, and so those are sort of a two different lines of thought of how the kidneys end up with sustained vasoconstriction. And um, and obviously, they have high pulbuminemia. They have this poor effective secretory volume. So with albumin, you're kind of trying to replenish that, maximize the effective secretory volume. But it's also interesting uh, data showing that albumin actually um, it kind of uh, models the endothelial dysfunction that occurs in hepatorenal syndrome and in a way t- t- tries to mitigate this uh, peripheral vasodilation uh, that occurs in cirrhosis. So although we think about albumin as a volume expander, it may have an effect that t- directly attacks the pathogenesis. Yeah, there's some thoughts that albumin, and I don't know if this has been discredited, but I've heard people banter around that uh, albumin may bind some uh, uh, circulatory factors that are uh, uh, directly causing the vasoconstriction, is that something that's still considered a viable th- uh, hypothesis? Yeah, yeah, that's the same literature that I've come across. I've never, I've never heard that before. That's, that's really interesting. The- so, and, and, and then you get to that point, uh, the next step is a vasoconstrictor. So uh, why would you use a vasoconstrictor to treat a hepatorenal syndrome where, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, this splanchnic vasodilation appears to be sort of a trigger for the uh, maladaptive renal vasoconstriction. So by using a vasoconstrictor, uh, you would uh, sort of reset the signal that goes into the kidney and kind of uh, counteract this vasoconstriction. Um, and when you try to look into the history, at least I've tried numerous times to see why is that uh, we kind of st- stuck with this vasopressin um, uh, analogs. Um, it appears that va- vasopressin V1 receptors are expressed in splenic circulation, but it's not the only system that controls uh, the blood flow in, in, in the mesenteric vessels and the supply circulation, but there's one of them. So essentially, you just want to restore that. Uh, that was kind of the foundation why uh, mitred and octodide and ornipressin, terlipressin, and vasopressin were tested uh, back in the sort of late 90s when the this, this studies uh, started. 
so I'll, I'll throw this question, Bill. We can start with you, and we'll we'll see uh, see where we get with this. Uh, everyone else can chime in too. W- let's say with our patient here. So he was oliguric, creatinine two point six. We gave him the albumin challenge. Let's say we even did almost forty eight hours. Uh, he got a hundred. You know, he got the twenty five Q six of albumin, and now creatinine's actually worsened. His creatinine's three. What? How soon do you pull the trigger on on these vasoconstrictors that we're talking about here? And can you? Yeah, and let's just start there. Classic teaching again from a lot of hepatologies. Once you define it as hepatorenal, that's when you start into this hepatorenal cocktail, right? Which sounds sort of exciting and sexy and all that. <laughs> um, and that's what hepatologists mostly are, right? We we can't disagree with that. Um, you've you've told it. You set that up from the beginning tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so you know, in, in somebody who hasn't responded to volume, and in a lot of in in reality, in real life, I don't necessarily even wait to somebody not responding to volume because most of my patients come in already so overloaded. They don't have a history of having a recent peritonitis or a new onset peritonitis, which might which might make you a little volume depletion and or volume depleted and kick tick. Uh, kick you over the edge. Um, but a lot of my patients, if I've gotten to that point where we've given two days of abdomen, there's no response. I'm, I'm, I've already started the panoreal cocktail 24 hours before. Um, and in, in this country, we use the panoreal cocktail of midadrenal octreotide and, um, and uh, albumin. Um, and if in, it was in, uh, in Europe, we would be using charlopressin. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different trials, which I think uh, JCV can hopefully go through some of these to um, differentiate which one is really the best and what may be the best for the future. Yeah, so, so uh, I agree. Uh, Mitre octreotide is uh, the most popular cocktail used in the United States. Uh, unfortunately, uh, in our institution, every cirrhotic that arrives to the emergency room uh, with the creatinine that is a little bit above normal gets Mitre octreotide. Uh, immediately as as part of the initial orders, which kind of muddies the picture when you try to then um, assess whether the patient is uh, HRS or not. Uh, it's hard to do that when the patient has been already receiving vasoconstrictors uh, on admission. Um, and and then it comes down to uh, what is most effective. And modern and octrotide um, has a role, is a very... Uh, inexpensive uh, combination that can be given oral and subcutaneously uh, in a regular floor. Uh, so it's convenient. And there is some uh, data showing some degree of efficacy. Uh, and, and in my personal experience, hasn't been very successful, but a small percentage of patients may respond to that. When you look at all the clinical trials um, that have been tested, uh, that have been uh, conducted to test different drugs for hepatorenal syndrome, uh, ultimately comes down to the mean arterial pressure. Uh, what is the achieved mean arterial pressure during the, during the trial? Whether you use mitodin octrotide, terribly pressing, and the one that I particularly use a lot, which is norepinephrine. It always comes down to when the signal. The signal for uh, renal recovery is strongly co- associated with uh, improvement in mean arterial pressure. And it could be a debate about, you know, how high you want to push the map. That's sort of a, a different topic. But the bottom line is that um, if you look at a very small trial in 1999, I, I remember, if I remember correctly, uh, they designed a study to push the miniature pressure by 50 millions of mercury with mitrogen and octrodide. And it's something that gets lost uh, because a lot of times patients get admitted, the hospital medicine team starts the, the mitrogen and octrodide combination but, but there's really little attention to the mean arterial pressure. Uh, and it's sort of an inertia there. It's, you know, 72 hours later, uh, you know, they're thinking, well, this, this consult in nephrology, nothing has happened. Well, of course, you know, the dose was never touched. It was left at a starting dose. Um, and, um, and, and that's something that needs to be emphasized. And, and uh, that's why it t- a, often goes straight to norepinephrine because it's just more effective raising the map. And, and I can get an answer a little bit faster. Hey, JCV, uh, if you have a patient who looks like a hepatorenal syndrome, but they have a systolic blood pressure of 130 or 140, do you kind of eliminate that from your differential? <sighs> Great question. Um, 
if the miniature pressure, and, and I don't know if I necessarily, uh, I guess systolic above 140 starts to, I start to get less and less excited that I'm in front of an HRS. Yes. You know, yes. you got you to gotta go back to the, you know, again, these old papers tell you the real story. When the hepatorenal syndrome was described in the 50s, early 60s, there were patients with blood pressure of 100 over 60, with sodium was 128, they were all oligurec. And, and, and that's the type of phenotype that, and, and amazing, those three factors that I just mentioned, they are not part of the diagnostic criteria from the International Club of Ascites. <laughs> I, I know. They it's put ridiculous. all these criteria they, that are so irrelevant, and the bottom line is that the phenotype of the patient is not in the definition. So, yes, I pay a lot of attention to that. Having said that, it's interesting because you can have a patient with a blood pressure of 125 over 65. The miniature pressure may be 78, 80. That, you know, you may think that that's inconsistent with a hepatorenal syndrome, but it's not necessarily inconsistent because there is sort of a, you know, there's a shift. There is an auto-regulatory curve that has shifted. And, in a patient, in, in a normal individual, a map of 75 is a great map, a great miniature pressure. But in a cirrhotic that presents with a map of uh, 71 or 72, he may need a map of 90 or 85 to adequately perfuse the kidneys. And, and that's something that, okay. um, that I pay attention to. The, the norepinephrine you were talking about, that those patients must, they, they need a central line and they, they're generally in the ICU when you're doing that? Yes, that is uh, unfortunately a limitation. There are some uh, hospitals in the country that have had just anecdotal conversations that have implemented protocols in step-down units, uh, and they can use norepinephrine. It's something that I've, I, I am trying to, to also implement in my hospital. But yes, most of the times, or almost universally, norepinephrine requires intensive care uh, unit uh, transfer which obviously is, is a limitation because you, you have to, uh, you know, as a consultant, communicate your recommendation to the, to the primary service, which in then is going to call the ICU, and the ICU is going to call you back, and you're going to have be in this triangle negotiation to try to, to uh, transfer a patient to the ICU who is otherwise normal intensive in the eyes of the intensivist. So there's a little bit of a disconnect in the understanding. And and sometimes you, you you call and you say, hey, this is what I would like to do with these patients. And sometimes, yeah, that makes total sense. Let's do it. And then, you know, I go on my computer late at night reviewing the, 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 what's going on with the patient and, and I pull the maps and the maps are like 65. And I call the ICU nurse and they ask you, yeah, we're doing map of 65. That's what we do for levofet. Uh, and so there's, the, many things get lost in translation. Uh, it's not a common approach to, to uh, give norepinephrine to a goal of map of 85. So even when you want to do it, it doesn't get executed properly. Joel, it sounds like you need one of your checklists. <laughs> or improved communication. Yeah, yeah there you go. <laughs> These were brilliant recommendations tonight. <laughs> well, the, the the thing I wanted to point out, so our producers had done a, re, a bit of like kind of looking into literature. This Wang et al. did a systematic review last year where they looked at terlipressin head-to-head, uh, terlipressin and al- albumin versus norepi and albumin versus the mitodrine octreotide albumin cocktail. And it looks like it looks like norepinephrine is, is at least as good or, or better than terlipressin but terlipressin, my, from my understanding, it's it's just more convenient to give it. So, do you think that's going to be coming to to the states at any point? Matt, can I just step in? Because yeah. I, I know what I, I I know what I wanted to say when you asked that, and I, and I think what I want to when you are thinking about moving these patients to the ICU, I think you need to think about what is the prognosis of the patient who has a renal syndrome that you do not reverse, and those patients are going to die. Right. If you have a classic type one HRS where their creatinine is going up and if they're not going to get a liver transplant quickly within a couple of weeks, they're probably going to be dead. And so, you know, it's it, you know, you, you might want to talk about how much it costs to move the ICU or what a hassle it is to do. But we are truly dealing with a mortal condition here. And you know, you're talking about here. Here's our last chance to save this guy. And so, um, you know. Fantastic Push. point. Yeah. 
So it's worth it. Uh, essentially, you're saying it's it's worth it. If if we if that's what the patient has and that's the right thing for the patient, you got to do it. And I don't think anyone's gonna. I mean, you 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 could, you could fight. It's worth fighting for that. That's my point. It, it is absolutely. It's a great point, Joel, because and that's when once again comes to really assess your patient uh, very well. Because you have a a cirrhotic patient with a bilirubin of thirty four, encephalopathic, uh, really uh, very very ill um, with very lo- with, that is not going to get a liver transplant. Uh, that you think even if I revert his kidney function, how much better this patient is going to be? What is his life expectancy? Is his quality of life going to be meaningful? But you, so that patient, I may not, I'd say, you know, maybe this is a patient that we need to call palliative care. But all cirrhotics are not the same. You may have a highly functional cirrhotic. It just happens to get HRS1. That patient is worth the fight and give him a chance to go to the ICU. And not just the ICU, uh, 15 years ago when I was in fellowship, if it was an alcoholic cirrhotic, especially with the recent drinking, it was not an indication to do dialysis once all the other therapies had failed. Um, Obviously, if you're really hepatorenal and you're not a liver transplant candidate ever, then you're not going to put this person's last days on dialysis and you really do need to invoke palliative care. And either way, we need to invoke palliative care. But Nowadays, at least, um, for the patients who are alcoholic, if you can keep them alive for six months and they can abstain during that time, then they might become a liver transplant candidate. So if you get to the point where that's where nephrologists are really getting is not when to start hepatorenal cocktails as much as when to start dialysis in someone who's failed. And we are often struggling with this, but, but in a patient who is a recent use of alcohol and hepatology comes by and says they're not a candidate for transplant, you still have to give them that chance. If you can keep them alive for six months, they may be a candidate for transplant. Now, how often does that actually occur? Probably less than 10% of the time, but you still have to give them that chance. Yeah, and I, I would concur uh, with Bill there is that I was taught that a paterenal syndrome was a disease that you did not dialyze. Like that was the dogma when I was a fellow and that, and we have definitely changed that and in selected patients, we offer it. I wanted to quickly just... Uh, JCV, I'll, I'll throw it to you. Hepatorenal syndrome, the type 1 versus type 2, how, how important is that to really kind of differentiate? Well, when you are dealing with patients with acute kidney injury in a hospital and cirrhosis, uh, you, you're almost always dealing with hepatorenal syndrome type 1. So the type 1 is, is a rapidly progressive uh, AKI creatinine deteriorates fairly quickly within the span of two weeks and uh, has all the elements of AKI. Hepatorenal syndrome type 2 refers for more of a chronic uh, subacute insidious entity uh, that I can say that occasionally when I see patients in clinic that come uh, refer because they have elevated serum creatinine, they happen to be cirrhotic and there's nothing you can find to explain why the creatinine is sitting at 1.8 and four months ago it was 1.3 and there's really nothing else going on. I mean, you know, this patient may have HRS type 2. There's no really a patient that I would, uh, you know, put him on a hepatorenal cocktail or anything like that. I kind of follow them alone. They, they tend to be uh, they tend to be fairly um, sort of benign in the course Um uh, uh, so I don't really uh, use that diagnosis in a hospital setting um, often. I think it's mostly HRS type 1, what we see and what the real challenging patients are. I wanted to ask about paracentesis before we, we start to sort of wrap up here because it, it often comes up where the the patient's kidneys are failing, They, they maybe they have tense ascites or massive ascites, and you're just kind of wondering, like, what to do there. Like, may, you, you certainly at some point are going to need to do a diagnostic power on that person while they're in the hospital. But then there's always this kind of dilemma we run into, how much fluid we tap them until they're dry. Um, Bill, I'll ask you first, and then we can kind of go around. Uh, what's your tact in those patients? Yeah, I'd like to actually hear what everybody says when we go around, because I, I try and get somebody euvolemia. You, you know, you want to take off enough and not too much. You want to make sure they get their abdomen back so that they don't drop their pressure. And, um, you know, I, I, I can't tell you how many times I've come by the next day and they got seven liters of a large volume paracentesis and they've gone from a creatinine of 
2.0 to 2.7 and you say, oh, well, that's why. And they shouldn't have done that. Uh, and so I, th I think I'm always a nephrologist and we always think about the kidneys always trying to gradually remove urine from the person uh, a, a, on a stable 24-hour basis. And that's why we like these CVVHs versus uh, acute HDs every once in a while. It's the same kind of thing. I think gradual fluid removal is best. I'd rather have a two-liter paracentesis every other day than seven liters uh, once a week uh, in somebody. So you kind of, it's, it's a, it's a gestalt, I guess is the word. It's a, um, it's a, it's a judgmental decision, but you know, I'd like to hear what everybody else thinks too. I, I like the large volume. I like to get that fluid off them, replace it with, put, replace the albumin. I'm happy to actually start the albumin beforehand. Even um, if you anticipate a large volume, usually you can, um, but I, I like getting that fluid off. I do worry about this tensocytes collapsing the renal vein and the IVC putting back pressure on the kidney. And so um, I think removing that fluid is the right way to go. Um, yeah, I, I find this area difficult. I think it's uh, controversial. You, you open a textbook in nephrology and you're going to read uh, one of the most common precipitating factors for age of hepatorenal is large volume paracentesis. Uh, and then you have this whole modern uh, 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 literature uh, speaking about abdominal compartment syndrome, uh, you know, killing patients in the ICU. So you're kind of in the middle of, okay, which one is true, right? It's really confusing. And the literature is really not very, doesn't help you, it's incomplete. Uh, there aren't a lot of papers that clearly show that LVP precipitates HRS. But like Bill said, I've been in that same situation. That I see patients getting worse after an LVP uh, during my practice. But at the same time, you know, if I have a patient with a tense ascites and you measure blood pressure and the blood pressure is 28 and the patient's bell is about to explode and it's very uncomfortable, of course, I want to send a patient for a paracentesis. So I don't really have uh, any... Uh, a clear answer. Obviously, I'm just giving you both ends, uh, and that's how I, try, I I am currently in this in this topic. I kind of go by the patient. Um, if uh, there's evidence of abdominal compartment syndrome and with very high blood pressure, I'm going to be very proactive about draining it out. Um, but many times I do it, and the patient gets worse. So I I'm not sure. It's it's very difficult. It's a very okay. difficult uh, area. I'm hearing that that I'm not alone in in finding this to be a conundrum and and yeah, being that's a good and point. and it seems this is one of those things like we we talk to specialists on the show all the time and there when we ask when we ask things where we see the practice just vary so widely it's often because it's sort of an evidence free zone or where there it's a highly artful practice where you just kind of have to take it case by case it sounds like this goes along those lines. Let, let me just add a comment. Uh, so when you read the clinical trials in the world of hepatorenal syndrome, you look at the methods, uh, they always make a little comment about whether paracentesis was allowed or not during the trial. And in most of the trials, it was, it is allowed. So that kind of goes <coughs> against the premise that LVP should be, LVP should be detrimental to the course of HRS. Okay. And, and what I try to do also, if I have a patient that I am actively treating for hepatorenal syndrome with, let's say, norepinephrine, a vasoconstrictor, and I am pushing the map, and the map is going up successfully, and the creatinine is reaching a plateau, mm -hmm. starting to curve down nicely. Without norepinephrine running, I am very comfortable sending that patient for an LVP with albumin, depending on the volume. I'm actually very comfortable putting back on diuretics because you are really maintaining renal perfusion with that map. And, you know, we, we stopped diuretics before we diagnose HRS, but once you are diagnosed and you're treating it, there's no reason not to bring the diuretics back into the picture if you're trying to remove volume. I don't know if- Wow, that, that is pretty cool. I have not seen that done. <laughs> that's that's pretty awesome. Joel, have you done that? No, I was thinking that was pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I like because it. it you know, think about it. You know, hepatorenal syndrome is not a volume depleted state, right? It's it's a, it's a disorder of hemodynamics that you're restoring with your intervention. Once you restore it, 
if a patient has massive edema and or urine output is not picking up, you you could add a diuretic. And I've done it uh, many many times, and and is rarely a problem actually. Let me check in with our producer, Dr. Justin Burke, and see if we have anything that we're missing here before we kind of get some take-home points. I don't think so. I think if someone wants to explicitly say that uh, what specific triggers can cause type 1 HRS, we mentioned LVP, but not things like infection or um, anything else that are common uh, presenting things. But otherwise, I think we've hit most... um, most everything that's been asked and uh, oh, other risk factors for HR. I don't think so. I think, I think we're in a good place. I think this has been great. Yeah. So I'll leave that think, out there. Bill, is there any major well, triggers or risk factors we miss? You know, I know. I, I think anything can kind of tip them over. They're so chronically volume challenged. You know, you blow them a little bit in one direction and they're going to tip over with a little peritonitis or one too large of a volume paracentesis or whatever. And there's a lot of different triggers, even a simple UTI or hepatic encephalopathy, then they're not taking the rest of their meds and then everything tips over. But um, so I think there's a lot of different triggers and it's really key, like uh, JCV said from the very beginning, to take the appropriate history and physical to, to nail it all down. I was wondering if we could just briefly mention the um, diagnostic criteria for hepatorenal by the the Journal Club, and 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 I think that you know a lot of the problem that nephrologists have with this um, with this criteria is that it's not really specific to hepatorenal. We we're so used to seeing renal failure of all sorts of types, and then we narrow it down on the different types of renal failure. But I think in the in the um, the Ascites Club, or I can't remember the exact name of the different clubs that they use to define these things, but I, I think a lot of them are just nonspecific uh, terms to diagnose renal failure, which is good. You want to make sure you do have renal failure, but there's a delta creatinine, there's a, a, a change in urine output, and, and you know there's all these things that are important to make sure that you're in the renal failure realm, but they're not really specific to hepatorenal. For example. You can have oliguria and hepatorenal and ATN and obstruction and all sorts of different renal failures. So, so the reason I think nephrologists kind of have a problem with some of the diagnostic criteria is that it's not, we, we want a diagnostic criteria that's more specific to narrowing down if it's hepatorenal versus other causes of renal failure. And this kind of just throws you in the, its renal failure realm. Um, and so I think that's why we, that's what this whole, um, really this whole podcast is about is to really how can we narrow down someone who has a pattern renal versus pre-renal versus ATN versus underlying GN or biocast nephropathy or all the different things that we've discussed. This has been another episode of the Curbsiders bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. <laughs> Said with confidence. Get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com. And while you're there, sign up for our mailing list to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. Plus, twice each month, you'll get our new Curbsiders Digest, recapping the latest practice-changing articles, guidelines, and news in internal medicine. We're committed to providing you with high-value, practice-changing knowledge. And to do that, we need your feedback. So please subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts or now on Spotify. You can also contact us at thecurbsiders at gmail.com. A special thanks to Hannah Abrams for putting together the pun contest for this episode and to Justin Burke, who was super producer for all our Nef Madness episodes in 2019. Yeah, whatever happened to that guy? Yeah, he's around. He's doing Curbsiders. <laughs> Paul, you know that. Come on. Yeah. Our executive producer is Beth Garbs Garbatelli. Nora Toronto is the editor for The Digest. Elizabeth Proto runs our social media. Stuart Brigham composed our theme music. And Paul, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And Matt, until next time, I remain Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. Facebook leads the industry in stopping bad actors online. That's because they've invested $13 billion in teams and technology to enhance safety over the last five years. It's working. Over the last few months, they've taken down 1.7 billion fake accounts to stop bad actors from doing harm. But working to reduce harmful and illicit content on their platforms is never done. 
Learn more about how they're helping people connect and share safely at about.fb.com safety. Facebook leads the industry in stopping bad actors online. That's because they've invested $13 billion in teams and technology to enhance safety over the last five years. It's working. Over the last few months, they've taken down 1.7 billion fake accounts to stop bad actors from doing harm. But working to reduce harmful and illicit content on their platforms is never done. Learn more about how they're helping people connect and share safely at about.fb.com safety.